percent growth with prospective partner elements. Indeed, we've seen a significant increase in outreach to us as countries weigh Iran's provocative actions and how they might respond. It's not coincidental, for example, that we now have eight major missile batteries spread across countries on the western side of the Gulf, where two years ago we had far, far fewer. Nor is it purely coincidental that we have two Aegis cruisers in the Gulf, or a number of new partnerships in the areas of air and missile defense and shared early warning. Meanwhile, in the Arabian Peninsula, we have seen important signs of progress against Al-Qaeda and extremist organizations, with the exception of Yemen, that is. The progress in this arena is especially significant for the United States and Europe because of the extensive political and commercial connections we have with the Gulf states, and because of the concerns we've had over the years about the growth of extremism on the peninsula and its transnational nature. It is hugely significant, therefore, that Saudi Arabia has virtually eliminated al-Qaeda from its territories, though the attack on Deputy Minister of Interior Mohammed bin Naif was unsettling, to be sure. That notwithstanding, the kingdom has implemented an impressive and effective comprehensive countering extremist program. We've also seen the other countries in the peninsula take effective, coordinated action against transnational extremists, and today's paper contains another account of that. The exception, as I noted, is Yemen, where we have seen the reestablishment of an al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula cell. The Yemeni government has, however, recently expressed its determination to combat AQAP in the tribal areas of South Yemen, even as it also deals with the Houthi issues in North Yemen and a number of Western and Arab countries are working to help the Yemeni government. There have also been mildly positive developments in Lebanon, where the outcome of the recent elections is encouraging, even if government formation still has not been completed, and where the government has taken resolute action against al-Qaeda and other extremist elements in recent years. We're working hard there, in fact, together with a number of other countries to support the development of the Lebanese Armed Forces even as we await developments in the efforts by Ambassador Mitchell and others to generate a bit of momentum in the effort toward a comprehensive Middle East peace, an effort that obviously has an important and tremendous impact on everything in the Middle East region. The situation in Syria, meanwhile, remains decidedly mixed. It's true that fewer foreign fighters now flow through Damascus into Iraq, down, in fact, from about 120 at the height of that flow probably less than 10 per month uh, in recent months. But that is more due to actions by source countries and damage to the foreign fighter facilitation network inside Iraq than it is to Syrian action, though to be fair, there has been some of that as well. Meanwhile, of course, Syria continues to maintain its ties to Iran and to pursue actions that undermine stability in Lebanon and the region. But it's also responded to engagement by Western envoys and delegations, including two that included major generals from the U.S. Central Command. And, of course, there was an important meeting in Riyadh at the Abdullah and President Mubarak and President Bashar al-Assad. There clearly are opportunities in Syria, but only time will tell whether Syrian leaders rep recognize that many think it has to come to see that fear Syria's future lies with the West and the Arab world. An important country in all of this, of course, has been Egypt, a state in which President Obama chose to give his very significant speech and where many of us have spent time in recent months as Egypt has worked to disrupt arms smuggling by Hamas, to support Ambassador Mitchell's efforts in the Mideast peace process, to support regional military exercises and operations, and to perform its traditional leadership role in the Arab world. The last sub-region of this tour around the Central Command AOR is Central Asia, or the stands, as they are sometimes called. Though Central Asia has received relatively less Western attention than the other sub-regions, Western nations do have a strong interest in establishing long-term cooperative relationships there and in helping to sustain a solid security environment. I have offered, since taking command of CENTCOM, that ensuring stability in Central Asia requires replacing the outdated, zero-sum paradigms of the new great game with a broad partnership to counter extremism and the illegal narcotics industry, and 
that message has resonated in many of the Central Asian states. In fact, we've already seen quite positive developments as the newly developed Northern Distribution Network that provides supplies and logistics through the stands into Northern Afghanistan helped by Russia's agreement to allow transit of lethal and non-lethal cargo through its territory begins to go into operation in earnest. Indeed, this initiative supplements very importantly the routes through Pakistan and it's one over which already some 60% or more of our fuel is now moved into that route. Well, having taken a very quick look at the situation in the Central Command AOR, it should be clear that varying levels of comprehensive, whole-of-government counterinsurgency approaches have produced some progress against transnational extremists in a number of states and areas. In particular, the Arabian Peninsula, Iraq, the Levant, Pakistan, and the Central Asian states. The security situation in Afghanistan, on the other hand, has deteriorated in recent years. But even there, pressure has been increased on the insurgent and extremist elements that we clearly face innumerable challenges, and progress will, as I noted earlier, require a sustained substantial commitment. Nonetheless, while progress in the Middle East may not be evident to the casual observer, if you take a long view, as I have tonight, perhaps too long, I'm afraid, you do see some important indicators of progress among what are, to be sure, a number of continuing challenges as well. Now, I've talked a lot about connections tonight, connections between local and transnational, the parts and the whole, and so on, all in keeping with the theme of my talk. And before I surrender the lectern this evening, I can't pass up the opportunity to mention one particular special connection to this audience, and that is the deep and abiding relationship between those who wear my country's uniform and those who serve in Her Majesty's Armed Forces. We feel very privileged to serve alongside, and in some cases, shoulder to shoulder with, your soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Royal Marines, as well as with your civilians. The qualities they exhibit, the initiative, innovativeness, and sheer competence, not to mention their moral as well as physical courage, these qualities should be a source of great pride to all of us. Just the other day, I took the daily CENTCOM briefing by video telecom as always, a couple of the British members of our staff were front and center in the frame. Indeed, we're delighted to have them there in our headquarters, just as we were delighted to have so many of them on our staff in Baghdad, not to mention the multinational division southeast of Mosul. They bring, as I noted, many great qualities to the tasks at hand, including wonderful British understatement and a dry sense of humor. During that staff update, for example, when I observed that a particular country may at one time have been part of the British Empire, your Air Vice Marshal Graham Stacey replied without hesitation, well, sir, most countries in the CENTCOM region were part of it at one time. <laughs> Those reminders of history notwithstanding, we have enormous respect for our British colleagues at CENTCOM headquarters, as we do for all of the men and women who wear your country's uniform. Having been privileged myself to serve alongside them almost nonstop since 2000, in Kuwait, the Balkans, Iraq, and now Afghanistan and elsewhere throughout the CENTCOM AOR, I can assure you that your pride in them is well founded. As I close, I should note that for an American military officer, particularly for one who is an amateur military historian, visiting London is always a bit of a pilgrimage. Many U.S. military traditions have some British precursors, and that shared heritage forms part of the special relationship that we have long cherished. Last year, I had the good fortune to recall an important moment in that relationship when I visited the World War II Cabinet War Rooms with the great General Sir Michael Jackson. During our tour, Jacko and I graciously permitted access to the personal map and planning range used by Prime Minister Churchill. And as we read some of Churchill's handwritten notes, we were transported back to that earlier era of extraordinary U.S. and U.K. cooperation. And we were once again impressed by the extraordinary competence of this wonderful country. It was another one of those times, in fact, when I've been tempted to agree 
with Cecil Rhodes' wonderful observation that being an Englishman is the greatest prize in the lottery of life. Well, if Cecil Rhodes is correct, and I'm inclined to think that he is, then the second greatest prize in the lottery of life must be to be a friend of an Englishman. And based on that, the more than 230,000 men and women in uniform in the Central Command area of responsibility who work with your country's finest on a daily basis are very lucky, very lucky indeed, as am I. Thank you very much.